in France. <laughs> or in the French taste by an English cabinet maker, but it, they just don't look alike, do they? It's a whole different ethos. Okay. Um, another little trick I'll throw in here. Always carry, a, uh, not a safety pin, what do you call those things? Paper clip in your pocket when you're out exploring. Because when you find holes Here's a screw holding this top to this apron, and beside it is another hole. The first thing you want to do is stick something down in there and see if it goes into the board below. Does it go in to that top? In this instance, I'm happy to say it does. So it, the top got loose, it just got looser and looser. They couldn't put screws in it any longer and get it to hold together. So they said, well, the simple thing to do is to put a new set of screws by where the old ones used to be. And there are all sorts of lovely things going on on this piece that we can really enjoy looking at. We can see how dark and cruddy this return is and how crisp and uncruddy that return is, which means that that return is newer than that return. And we can see here where a glue block was lost that used to prevent the air from getting over here. So we have disturbed oxidation here and disturbed oxidation here. These are all, we can see there used to be glue block in there, went up about that far in, in that spot. So these are all the things that using our eyes and our senses allow us to explore. People will say, what in heaven's name are those people doing underneath that table? Well, what in heaven's name they're doing is looking for just this kind of thing. And if they find something that really bugs them, they're going to say to the dealer, well, let's turn it upside down and look really carefully. Look out here. Look how pretty and new looking that board is. That's where the leg, the gate leg, kept that wood protected because as it folded up against it, then no air could get to that board. Therefore, it did not oxidize. Fake desks, oh my God, and secretaries. I see it all the time. You open the interior and look at the drawers and they've got ink and darkness and all of this. Well, that's smoke and mirrors because that's all the stuff that was sealed up inside. The air can't get in there. It should be less oxidized, not more oxidized. But the faker thinks, oh, those people want to see dirt, grease, grime, and oxidation. So I think I'll darken up the inside of all these drawers and make them look old. But they're not supposed to look old. Here we have a beautiful oval drop leaf table. American, about 1750 to 1780 in the Queen Anne taste. The first thing you know as you study drop leaf tables is that oval ones are more valuable and rarer and less common than rectangular ones. What does that tell you about the larcenous heart? We can't get those oh. <laughs> Do anything. Don't All right. <laughs> Yank. No. <laughs> well, we wouldn't have I know. You're just so careful and thank you. <laughs> she didn't tell me what that tells you about the larcenous heart. <laughs> Oval tables and rectangular tables. Oval tables more valuable than rectangular tables. What do you do to rectangular tables? Make them oval. Right. So anytime you see an oval table, you want to look at it very carefully. And if you look at this one very, rather carefully, you'll see that there is a tiny little line running across here where this board happens to be two boards rather than one. Now that's not impossible. It is very possible that Mrs. Gottbucks was having the governor to dinner in about 1770 or so and decided that she needed a new dining table. And she went around to the cabinet maker and she said, you know, my table seats four rather uncomfortably. I want a beautiful, elegant, oval table because the governor is coming to dinner next month and we have to have something finer than we have. And the cabinet maker, yes, madam, yes, madam. 
Let's plan the size. They plan the size. They decide how big the leaves will be, how big it will be when it's open. It's all decided. She gives him a dollar deposit, and off she goes down the muddy street to her house. And the cabinet maker goes gleefully out to his pile of fine wood, and he starts measuring for that big leaf. And lo and behold, every darn board out there is only that wide. Now, does he run after her and say, oh, my dear, go see the German around the corner. He might have bigger boards. Here's your dollar back. <coughs> of course not. He picks two beautiful big boards, two compatible small boards. He takes them into his cabinet shop. And while they are still just the cured, air-dried wood, he glues them together. And they have been cut at the same time in the same process, they will be the same thickness to make sure it's a perfect fit, you know. He gets it nice on his work table and make sure he gets a good glue joint. He'll double a mortise and tenon in here to hold it together. He'll do a really great job. Never gonna come apart. And then he cuts it out and he planes it and he sands it and he finishes it and he delivers Mrs. Gottbuck's her table in time for the governor's dinner party. You, by the way, disturbed oxidation on this table as if you didn't know from looking at it, it's been stripped and refinished. Look at where these two boards are joined. The larcenous heart has a rectangular table and he goes to his pile of mahogany also and it's been from another old table somewhere that's been broken up and he selects some wood and he takes the two pieces of wood into his workshop and he glues that small board to the big board and he makes darn sure that on that finished surface, he lays this down so that he has an absolute perfect join where those two boards come together on the finished side. Now he's gonna have to clean it up and refinish it and strip it and all that, but he wants that to be perfect. But because those two boards were not cut at the same time, were not cut from the same pile of wood, were not joined at the same time in the same cabinet shop 250 years ago, he has a problem on the backside. They're always slightly, one slightly thicker than the other. No problem. You take a block wrapped in sandpaper and you start sanding. And you sand and you sand and you feel it. Oh, it's getting there. I can just barely feel the difference now. Sand some more, sand some more, sand some more. And pretty soon, he can run his fingers along that little join, and you can't tell it. But you can. Because all you have to do is not go, oh, isn't that nice? You start here, and you run your fingers to there, and you find a dip. We call it shallowing. And everywhere those two boards come together, there's shallowing. There's a little dip because he and his sandpaper wore it all down and created that. And anytime you find two boards together that you're suspicious that they didn't start life together, go to the underside and feel. Don't feel just, you know, namby pamby right along the edge. Be bold about it. You know, rip that top open. You know, check it out. And you'll find shallowing. And if you don't find shallowing, then it's probably okay. Here is where real antiques generally come from. They come from big palatial houses like that. And the middle class as it emerged at the end of the 18th century and into the 19th century as well. And in the library there at Wilton House, we find this piece of furniture, one of the most famous pieces of furniture in all of English history. It is called the violin bookcase, there being the violin. It has never left the spot it is sitting in. 
since Thomas Chippendale's firm delivered it. And the family still has the bill of sale from Thomas Chippendale's workshop, and it still identifies who did the carving. And this is what, you know, makes for a, if this ever comes to market, and I think that it never will, but in today's time, you know, a 10, 20 million dollar piece of furniture. If this house had been pulled down after the war, as so many of these great houses were, this would have become a most unusual and exciting and dramatic sideboard cabinet. It would have become sans the bottom, sans the two wings, base added, finish up that side with some new veneer, an extraordinary, rare, and visually dynamic bookcase of the mid-18th century. And these would have become that most desired and rare object, a pair of chimney cabinets on bracket feet. And that's really what did happen over and over and over again to great 18th century furniture. And that's why, one, you have to be alert to the fact that it may have happened to the piece you're thinking of buying, and two, why all those things that have survived and haven't had that done to them have become more valuable as time has gone by. And finally, this is the other place that genuine antiques come from. This is the Anthony Hay workshop reconstructed in Williamsburg, Virginia on its original foundation. Here is Mrs. Gottbucks supervising the loading of her new uh, crib, uh, rocking crib and chairs to be delivered to her home in the latest and most modern of conveyances uh, to her home. And that is where real antiques come from. And that is the truth. That is the same workshop that the chair that I found and showed you came from. That is the same workshop that made that very first piece of furniture I showed you. That's where real antiques come from.